We don't have that voice, we get nervous, you know? So, um, yeah, so we're just finishing up yesterday's shir. We're about to go into Purim. And in essence, you know, the idea that we honed in on is this idea of that why does Hashem create this concealment? Why does Hashem create this idea of Choshek? Not, in, not just in the frame of nighttime, but in the frame also of our lives. Like, why can't we see our shidduch? We were just talking about that. Why can't we see, you know, our ultimate destiny? Why can't we see, you know, the person that we're supposed to become? Why can't we see these things? Why is there this aspect of darkness? And so there's a famous Rabbi Nachman quote on the idea of lech lecha. And he says, as a commentary, he says, when Hashem tells Abraham lech lecha, to leave from where you started from, leave from your father's house, leave from everything that you know, leave, go from there. Everybody knows Abraham eventually, you know, came to Eretz Israel. So we think, Lech Lecha, go to Eretz Israel. But Rabbi Nachman makes a very key point. He says that Lech Lecha was something that Hashem said, but Abraham had to go through a journey to get to the ultimate destination, which was Mitch, which was Egypt, I mean, which was Eretz Israel. And eventually, even when he came to Eretz Israel, there was a famine and he had to go to Egypt and then come back to Eretz Israel, right? And so he says, why didn't Hashem just tell Abraham, go to Eretz Israel? Why didn't he tell him that? He said, because when a person, and this is a, an important, important, important point. When a person is on a righteous journey, Hashem is going to conceal the next steps. He's going to create choshek. He's going to create a dynamic. Go, how is this going to happen? Oh, I've got a wedding. How is this going to work out? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? What? Why can't it be clear? If I was doing, if I was having a wedding, the same person who say like, okay, so say take a person who's having a wedding, right? Say they're having a wedding on Purim. And, and, and take that same person out of the situation of they're having a wedding but someone else that they know was having a wedding at the same time. They weren't having a wedding. We know a person was having a wedding, but let's play a game where we take this person and take them out of a wedding. And then the, another person who's not having a wedding, let's put them in that situation. The person who was having the wedding will have all the answers. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this. But when it's their wedding, it's Choshek, it's darkness. Because when you're doing something righteous, it's going to be dark. Why? So the question is, why does it have to be dark? It has to be dark because every single step that you take, you got to cry out to Hashem for directions. Because you don't know. What am I supposed to go? I go left, I go right. What am I supposed to do? You have to cry out for Hashem. Imagine Avram Avinu leaves everything behind. And then he goes to Eretz Israel. And it's a famine. I think there's a Mafarshim that say it was the first famine in, in world history, which is everything stopped to grow. Think about that. The destiny, the ultimate, your place that you go, and that place is not settled yet. So the idea is to say that as we go forward on our journey, Hashem has to create darkness because he wants our tefillah. He wants us to cry out for him. So he's going to create that. Imagine if the Jews understood the whole thing of Purim. What is really, what is really Nechuda of Purim? That the Jewish people rise to power and they conquer the entire land of Persia. What did they take out? Was it 73,000 people that were taken out by the Jews? Imagine if they were going to Achish Veros' meal and said that the fact that we're eating this meal is going to lead us to being the most conquerors people in this land. They couldn't imagine that. They couldn't see that. They thought they were finished. They thought they were finished, but the whole situation was designed for them to get to a place where they would rise to greatness. They couldn't see. It was already said when in the, when the world of Brachis, we learned Brachis. In the beginning, everything was created. Everything that will be happened, everything that was happening, even to the point, even before Brachis. The, 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 the Midrashim say that, you know, things like um, Ganadin were already created. Mashiach was already created. Tshuva was already created. The need for Tshuva was already created. 
These things were already created. So we're sitting up in the world of Choshek, of darkness. And we're panicking and we're nervous. And we don't know how it's going to work out. Trust in Hashem. It's a system. It's already designed. The Yom Tovim are tremendous places of Debekis, where a person could cling to Hashem. But the Yom Tovim are also teaching us that the whole system is working on a pattern. It's working on a pattern, the whole thing. The whole idea is working on a pattern. So we're sitting here and we're nervous. We're sitting here and we're losing hope. We're sitting here and we wanna fight for our lives because we don't realize that, you know what? We already are successful. You know, like in sports, right? You look at a sporting game and you gotta watch the game to see who wins. Or sometimes you don't even have time to watch the game. Like me, I, I've, I've not seen a, a sporting game in I don't know how many years, but I've seen highlights. So you see the highlights to find out who won. You find out who, was, who wasn't who was playing well and then turn out to be playing well. You watch the highlights. But the highlights are to let us know this dynamic of who is supposed to win or who won the game. When you're Jewish and you're following the system of the Torah, you already won the game. It already happened. You're already victorious. You're already going to be witness to the Geula. You're already going to be witness to Mashiach. It's already done. What are we worried about? The Jewish people were scared that they were finished, that Haman was going to destroy them. The very thing that Haman designed was the very thing that hung him. This is the level of Purim. And so what is this idea of the Megillah? What is this idea of the Megillah? What are we reading the Megillah for? What do we, what do we, okay, it's a story. We get it. It's very nice. Jews words. No, there's a light that's coming down from Shemaim on this particular day. On the 15th of Adar, there's a light. The light that's ending the process of the winter where everything is concealed. The Megillah, there's not a mention of Hashem. It's not limited to, oh, well, you know, the Megillah is trying to teach us a, a powerful a, 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 a powerful idea that Hashem is concealed. No, it's, 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 it's allowing us to leave this process of concealment even by season. Even the seasons are concealed and we're leaving this process. So this idea of the Megillah is to elevate us to understand that everything prior was concealed, but now we're experiencing and going to an era where everything is revealed. Everything is revealed. All the light is revealed. All the growth, all the things that were growing in concealment. You know, a lot of times people go on their spiritual journeys, right? They leave their past. They leave negativity. And you so what? You know what? And they go on a spiritual journey. You know what happens sometimes? What they don't realize is, is that every action that we've ever made in our life plants a seed that's going to grow. And our negative actions grows into weeds, right? Not trees, weeds. Yeah, not weed, but weeds. And so the point is, is to say, that when people go on their spiritual path, they're like, wait, I'm changing. I'm, I, I've accepted this new Derek. I'm doing all these positive things. I'm doing all these mitzvot. I'm doing all these different dynamics. But guess what? They're still walking in the field that was planted by negative seeds. And so they see all these negative seeds and they're like, wait, I did all this stuff. I'm making all these changes. And that makes them want to give up. That makes them want to give up because they've seen stuff from the past, okay? Even if a person converts to Judaism, it's a new era in their life for sure. The averas that they committed are for sure gone. They're not chayev to them. But the reality of the world that they created is still in front of them. It's still in front of them. And eventually, at some point, I'm going to go back to Los Angeles, right? People don't realize Los Angeles for me is a balagan for many reasons. Number one, I grew up there. 
Number two, I worked in the media space, which means I was in the news. I was in television. I was in a newspaper because everything in the media space gets publicity. That's how it makes money. People got to know about it, right? If I sold hot dogs and I say I became a multimillionaire selling hot dogs, nobody would ever know about it. And then to top it off, eventually I got sick of the media space and I didn't feel I could make changes. And so I ran for office. Not only did I run for office, I ran as a Republican. I ran as a Republican. This is, this is, this is anger and rage in Los Angeles. How dare you, as a Black person, run as a Republican in Los Angeles? And not only that, I'm Jewish. So there's people there that love and support and are down for me, but there's people there that are just like, get this guy out of here. He should never come back. We don't want to see, this is messing up the matrix too much. This is a glitch in the matrix. He's a glitch in the matrix, a Black Republican Jewish guy. It's a glitch. So the point is, we got to go back to Miami to, you know, we got to go to Miami first to be able to set up our bunker where we could like have our machine guns and our, and our, and our bags of sand and we have our bunker we could hide out in and we start shooting our, 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 our uh, missiles of loves, our missile of forgiveness, our missile of love all the way back. But the point is to say like this, I converted, right? Everything should be over. Even though we transform ourselves, even though we change, there's still a remiss to the person that we were before. And our biggest challenge is to be able to move forward in our life and to see that, and to see that connection, and to embrace that connection as part of the process, because it's also part of the darkness. So again, the idea of the Megillah, this idea of Purim, is allowing us to elevate to a madrega where we can see the oneness of the system. Right? What are we talking about? Haman and Mordechai. Haman is Choshek, Mordechai is Or. We're, we're leaving the winter, we're going into the spring. We're leaving a time of concealment. We're going into a time of new beginnings and sprouting of the life that's coming through. So in Purim, we're supposed to get to the place that we can't tell the difference between Haman and Mordechai. What does that mean? It means that there's no difference between the concealment and the revealment because we're in the world of the system, how the system is created. We're in that reality. We're in the reality that there's moments of concealment and there's moments of light and there's to moments of total manifestation. We're in that reality. Think about what we're saying right here. Like, this is humongous. Because when, every, when the sages say that everything is tov, when the Torah tells us that everything is tov, how do I believe that? When I'm going through darkness. When I'm going through darkness, how do I believe that? It's not darkness, it's hesed, but it's a hesed that expresses itself through concealment. And when we're reading the Megillah, the Megillah Esther, we're connecting to that powerful energy of elevation above the Mahut. That elevation that we go to the level where we're able to look at the Mahut and see how everything comes together, how everything is one, how everything is, is, is in our favor, even when it seems like this is the end and we're about to, God forbid, lose our lives or someone is gonna hurt us. No, never, no one's gonna hurt you. You're now in the Torah. You're in the Torah now, what are you scared of? So here's a little story I'm gonna say. And I think the story can allow us to get close to, you know, you know, give people a little bit of break, as Benjamin says, give them a break before the next year. And it's a story that actually I came up with. It's a story. I mean, you got to think of your own Mashaling too, no? So it's a story. It's a story about a boy. And he grew up 
a giver. And he grew up in a, in a kingdom, powerful kingdom. They were in charge of 120 providences, ah, similar to what Esther was in charge of. And this boy's parents, who were the king and queen, went on a vacation and they went on a, in a boat trip. They wanted to, you know, go on a vacation. And so his parents died. The boy was like probably around like 10 years old. I think he was 10 or 11 years old. And so, and so this boy on this journey, this boy on this journey, when he's around 10 or 11 years old, his parents die. And so he becomes the king at a young age. And years go by and he's, he's, he's being the king, he's making decisions. He has advisors. Everybody's counting on his decision-making. He is a continuation of his parents' rulership, which was his grandparents' rulership and his great-grandparents' rulership and his great-great-grandparents' rulership and his great-great-great-great-grandparents. And this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. And so now the whole kingdom rests on his shoulders. But the thing is, the way that the castle was designed, the castle overlooked one of the providences. And in the providence that he was living in, there was a lot of other, those families, there was community, and they were all connected to the kingdom. They were like people who were very close to the kingdom, who did work for the castle, who did work for the courtyard, who supplied different things for the kingdom. He did, they did all that. And so, and so he would sometimes go outside and look through one of the windows of the castle and he would look and he would see boys that are his age playing games. And they had different balls, they had courts, they had fields and they would play and they would play. He could hear them yelling and screaming and tackling each other and having fun and this whole thing. And he would sit there and be like, wait, why? Am I put in this situation that I have all this responsibility and I can't be like these other kids? Look how much fun they're having. They have friends. They're enjoying themselves. And he used to do it. He used to watch this for years. And he got to a certain age. I think he was around like close to 15. He says, you know what? I want to go out there and play with them. It's OK. I, I can still go to the outside and play, and I can come back to the kingdom. So he goes out and he plays with the guys, you know, say it's like soccer, you know? But you know, it's before soccer was created. So something like soccer, croquet maybe, who knows? And so he goes out and he plays with the kids and he's just, he's in, he's had some of the funnest, the funnest time of his life. Since his parents died, he hasn't had so much fun. He's been like dealing with serious responsibilities, taxes, laws, you know, maybe war. He's been dealing with serious stuff. And so he's out there for the first time and he just forgets about all of his responsibilities and he's just enjoying himself, right? And he's enjoying himself and he's having a tremendous time. And, and he says, he goes back into the kingdom and he says, you know what? The people who are living in a common place, they're living good lives. They're living good lives. So what does he do? He goes back out again and he changes his clothes and he travels other places and he meets other people. No one knows who he is. He's just living, he's experiencing life. And he travels to one providence, enjoys himself, another providence and another providence. And this goes on for months. Nobody in the kingdom knows where the king is at, but he leaves a note and says, I'll be back soon. He left a note for the people that come in. I'll be back soon. I'm, I'm going on the trip, a secret trip. And so he goes on this trip. He goes on this trip and he's gone. And so he gets to this one providence that's literally like maybe a month's worth of travel or two months worth of travel away from the kingdom. And he sees an enemy approaching and he sees people panicking 
and he realizes that another nation has declared war on his kingdom. And he realizes that they've declared a war in his kingdom. And he's like, oh my goodness, there's no defense set up for this. And he starts to panic. And he, and he starts to panic and he gets on a horse and he starts going back towards his kingdom. And he's traveling day and night, day and night, day and night. And by the time he gets to his kingdom, the enemy has already seized the castle. To the point he comes and he knocks on the, the front door, this humongous door, he knocks, I'm the king, let me in, I'm the king, let me in. They say, oh, you're the king? And they take him and they put him into a dungeon. And he stays there for the rest of his life. Now, what is this story teaching us? This story is teaching us about when we as Jewish people see what the rest of the world is doing. We see the life that they're living and we wanna leave our place of responsibility. Why do we got so many laws? Why do I gotta be so Kodesh? Why do I have to separate myself from all of humanity? Why do I have to live in a small bubble amongst other Jews? Why can't I just be like everyone else? And unfortunately, many Jews fall into that. They want to go out. They want to play the games. They want to travel the provinces. They want to take off their royal clothing of being sneered, of having being, being royalty in, in the frame of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and looking like a Jew, looking like someone in the royal palace. And they want to let all those things go and they want to join in. And they want to travel around the world. They want to eat the foods of the world and this whole thing. And guess what? What happens? The negativity of the world says, oh, this is our opportunity. These Jews that are supposed to be keeping the mitzvah, creating a fence around Hashem's olam are now gone. They've left the palace. Now it's our time to come into the palace and influence the whole world with darkness. This is our time. And so this is the idea of Purim. This is that idea. The idea is to say that there was a moment where the Jews forgot about their responsibility in Sushan. They wanted to be like all the other nations. And they forgot their responsibility. And the darkness started to seep in. And the darkness came to a point where someone like Haman, now you can sit there. Haman became a ruler. It became power to the point that he was able to put a decree out against these, these people who were responsible for the mitzvot to keep the real palace. And so we know through the leadership of Esther that the Jewish people were able to regain exactly their position, which was being in a place of rulership and influence of the Shekinah in this world. And so through that process, they were able to complete their journey. But this is the point. When that prince is in the palace and he's looking out, outside and he's questioning his responsibility versus what he's seeing outside, this is the darkness. This is the choshe. This is the darkness. I'm seeing a reality, it looks so fun. It looks so amazing. It looks so amazing, wow. Look at all the fun that's happening. And I have to be a Jew. And I can participate in that. I have all these responsibilities. I have all these things that I have to do in life. But I can't be a part of that. This is the idea that we're supposed to bring into the world. Because the world is designed for us to not reach our potential. 
to not understand why we were created in his world, what our purpose is. And so this world that we live in is supposed to give us this element of darkness. Just like we're learning right now, Purim, winter, nothing grows, but it's growing underground. Purim, winter, nothing's growing, but it's growing underground. We can't see it. We can't see it. But it's going to grow. Right after Purim, that's when spring happens. That's when everything starts to blossom. This is the darkest point. What do they say in the morning? The darkest mo moment of the morning is right before the light comes out. Rosh Chodesh, where's the moon? I can't see it. It's dark, but it's a new beginning. Chaman, winter, concealment. But he's only building a, a process to Mordecai, which is the new beginning for the Jews, a new Torah that came into this world. Connect the dots, Purim, Haman, Mordecai, same thing, Echad. There's no more illusionary process where the darkness is ruling my life. Haman is necessary for Mordecai to exist. Darkness has happened in order for light to exist. This is Purim. So when you're drinking your shots and you're drinking and you're partying and you're dancing in Nakhlot and you want to forget about life and you have your wacky tobacco. You guys know what that is. But the point is when you're doing all these things and you forget about life, what is the Torah trying to say? That the darkness of life in the revealment of life, same thing. It's part of a process. That's it. In the Megillah that we read at night and in the morning is allowing us to, it's like a satellite dish on the top of your house. It's a satellite dish. And there's a light coming down into this world. So you need the satellite dish to capture this light so it could come into your house through television screen, and you can watch the information. So the light that's coming down into this world in Purim is captured through reading the Megillah. And when you capture it through reading the Megillah, the information comes into your life. In the same way, there's information waves that are out in the world from, 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 from all over the place. And you need a satellite in your, over your house to be able to watch television in your house to get the information of TV, but you need the satellite on your roof. So the Megillah is the satellite that allows the light from above to come into this world in order to make it accessible to us. Fasting is part of the spiritual technology that allows us to cleanse our vessel, to allow our neshama to elevate in order for us to receive this light. Giving sadaka is part of this idea of giving part of what we think is ours and giving it over because it also clears the vessel. Reading the Megillah, and then we have a Suda, and that Suda is the manifestation of all this work that we've been through in order to get to the mind that darkness and light are all from Hashem. And when I think that it's dark, it's because Hashem is creating something that's concealed. And I'm gonna finish with one last story and then I'm done. Because Rabbi Pentecost is gonna be starting. Huki Nashi, helping the women get the prophecy. That's what they want. Want to be a prophet? Got to come to this year. Prophetess, woman power, estrogen, prophetess. So anyways. So it's not a sad story, but it should give a story of inspiration. And I said it before. Who's seen Tom and Jerry? The cartoon Tom and Jerry, who's seen it? Okay, people have seen it. Not just me, support, you seen Tom and Jerry? Okay, even people from Texas seen it. So you have a cat chasing a mouse. 
That's the story. So you have a, a mouse, he's running for his life. He's running, 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 running. And he's being chased by this cat. And this cat's like, oh, I gotta, I'm going to get this mouse. I'm hungry. I got to eat. I got to eat. I got to eat. And so this mouse is running for his life. And so this mouse is running in this house. He leaves the house. He goes outside. Maybe he's in Africa. I'm not sure. Because there's an elephant there on the side. There's not so many elephants in America. So there's an elephant watching this cat chasing his mouse. And the elephant's like, oh, my God, this poor little mouse. So the elephant does, takes his trunk, goes into the mud, snorts out some mud, and snorts it out, snorts it out on the mouse, and the mouse becomes covered with mud. And so the mouse is like, whoa, what happened? And the cat's like, wait, what happened to the mouse? What happened? Whoa, whoa. All the, all the cat sees is a hill. But underneath this hill is the mouse. So the mouse is in this hill underneath all this mud. And he's like, whoa, what's going on? The cat's looking around like, where is this mouse? What I've been chasing this thing for hours. Where is it? So the mouse starts to say, like, okay, I don't know what happened. The cat disappeared. The mouse disappeared. The cat says, I don't know what happened. The mouse disappeared and starts walking away. And so the mouse is covered by all this mud. And he's like, what happened? Why am I covered in all this mud? I got to get out of this mud. What are you doing? I'm running from the mouse. And he starts digging himself out, digging, 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 digging out. And he digs, he digs, he digs, he digs. And eventually the mouse breaks through the mud pot, the mud hill, and he pokes his head out. And he pokes, he pokes his head out. And he's like, ah, ah, I made it out. And as he says that, the cat who's walking away turns around and he hears it. He's like, Rawr! and he runs back. <laughs> he runs back and he kills the mouse. So what do we learn from that story? Sometimes in life, the darkness that we're experiencing is protecting us. That darkness is protecting us. That mouse, that mouse is being protected by the cat that was trying to attack us. So every day, anybody who's spiritual, Anybody who's keeping by the Torah is running from their Yitzhahara. The Yitzhahara is chasing them every day. Do this, do that, be this way. Guy of all these the Yitzhahara is chasing us all the time. And that's the cat. The cat is the Yitzhahara chasing us. And we're the innocent little mouse that believes in Hashem, who wants to go higher. And so we're running from this cat that's trying to get us. And so sometimes Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to put Choshek on you. And that Choshek is going to protect you from the Yitzhahara that's chasing you. And we're like, no, it's too dark. I don't like this. What's going on? I'm, I'm suffering. And we want to get out of it. And we want to get out of this darkness. And we go, no, I want to get out of it now. I want to change this now. No. And we won't deal with it. We won't sit there. We won't accept it. That darkness that we're experiencing is from Hashem. It's there to protect us from the Yitzhahara, from all the negativity that we don't even know is coming against us. When Bilam was cursing the Jews, the Jews had no idea. It's protecting us from things we don't even know that's happening. And so we experience darkness, and then we say, oh, you know what? I want to give up. You know what? Get me out of here. Let me change the sugya. And we don't realize that that darkness is protecting us. So in closing, we have a man named Yosef Asadik, who did one of the greatest acts of restriction, which is protecting his yesod from Ishish Potiphar. And what happens next? He gets thrown in the jail. But if you look at the Madrashim, the Madrashim say on that day that he was seduced was a whole like festival in Mitzrayim on the Nile, worshiping the god of the Nile. It's okay. Bantu. <laughs> the Bantus are coming. <laughs> Full force. So Yosef Asadik, he, he was also Bantu. He was by the Nile. That's, that's proof he was but not Bantu. So uh, Yosef Asadik, he he's, he's by the Nile. And, and at this particular day, Ishis Potiphar is coming to seduce him. And it was a huge festival of Avadah Zara. 
And so he didn't want to participate in this festival. He didn't want to participate. He didn't want to participate in this festival of other czar. So he stayed in the house. So the Mafarshim say when when Yosef Asadik resisted Ishus Potiphar, when Yosef Asadik resisted Ishus Potiphar, it wasn't that he just resisted a, a, a woman. He resisted all the temptations of Mitzrayim. Oh, he's listening to what I'm saying now. <laughs> all, 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 all the temptations of Mitzrayim. All the darkness of, it, uh, of Mitzrayim. And it was fully manifested through this, I, this, in, this situation of this is Potiphar. And so this is my personal kiddish from the situation, okay? Take it for a grain of salt. But people say Yosef Asadik, when Yosef Asadik went to jail, there's different Mepharshim say certain things happen, he wasted seed. Different things happen, right? This is my personal kiddish from the situation. When Yosef Asadik was put into jail for those 12 years, he was protected from all of the darkness of Mitzrayim for those 12 years. All of the Avada Zara. And he was protected from the Avada Zara to the right time for him to emerge and to become great beyond his imagination. So it would look like, wow, he's being punished, he's being put in a jail. That jail was a rock monument. Imagine if he had another 12 years dealing with Yusuf. It's just Potiphar. Would he survive? Another 12 years of the Vadazara, would he survive? It's a fair question. If he was that tempted then, what would another 12 years done for him? So the fact that he was in jail was a concealed Rahmanis for what he was supposed to become. And so from that place, he was able to be protected, safe, until the right time for him to emerge as a leader and to emerge in a place, not only to be a leader, but to be able to save the world. And that takes us back to that marshal of the king or the prince leaving to be a part of what everybody else is. Joseph Asadi didn't forget. And he was able to save the world. Is there any questions? Any points? Rabbi Natan usually has something. It was to punish the American. <laughs> Okay, so in closing, just to summarize everything, because we have people who came in late. Purim is connected to this idea of concealment. And we can understand this idea of concealment, not just by the story of Esther and Mordecai, but even during the time of the year. Amen. Even during the time of the year, where the story manifests is towards the end of the winter. And towards the end of the winter is a time where there's a tremendous amount of darkness, but it's the, it's, the, it's the cusp of going into a new era of light. Haman represents the darkness, the concealment. Everything that Haman did seemed as it was something to destroy the Jewish people, but it was a process. It was a process for the total rebuilding of Mordecai. And not just Mordecai, B'nai Israel as a whole, where they were able to bring the Torah down on a new level, a connection to God on a new level. So the concealment being the winter, because everything, things are still growing underneath the ground, right? Seeds are still manifesting under the ground during the winter, but they only come out during the spring. So when the Torah is asking us on Purim, to not know the difference between Haman and Mordecai is for us to be connected to the total system of revealment. Because in a total system of revealment, there has to be this moment of opposition. And that moment of opposition is really the manifestation of the seeds of total success. But what happens is sometimes we have yeush, sometimes we want to give up. Sometimes we think things are not working out for us, but it's ultimately is working out for us. Everything is going to manifest. 
everything that we ever desire is already chosen for us. We already won the basketball game. We don't have to wait four quarters. We already won. And so my bracha to everybody that when we do the fasting, we elevate our neshama past the body consciousness, that when we give sadaka, that we're taking something that we feel is, is part of who we are and we're separating an aspect of that and saying, no, it's only, it's, it's, everything is from Hashem. And then we, we read the Megillah, we elevate our consciousness, we expand our consciousness to see this total reality, to see the total big picture. And when we have our Suda, when we have our Suda, that we'll be able to manifest this new consciousness that everything is echad, everything is one. What we think is darkness, when you're a Jew, and you're keeping the Torah, is working for us. And it's only building us to this process of spring. And this process of spring is a new order, a new Seder. So may we all know Haman and Mordecai as both being instruments for our own personal lives and for our community to achieve greatness beyond imagination. Any, any questions? We're good? Baruch Atah Adonai. Baruch Adonai. Leolam. Amen. Be amen.